So yeah, welcome everybody. We're excited to have you guys for our um, second virtual field trip of the fall semester and our first hot topic. We have with us Ms. Whitney Darnell. She was our um, speaker last week. She is a professor in the Department of Communications and her focus is health communication. And then we also have um, Dr. Zachary Hart, who is also in the Department of Communications, and he um, does public relations, if I remember correctly, but he's also been doing some research with Whitney in health communication. So we're going to listen to their research, and hopefully they can provide us with some awesome information about um, disability inclusion. So I'm back. I saw many of you last week at our Meet the Expert. Um, and this week, I wanted to bring a friend, Dr. Hart. Um, both of us did separate studies last year and the year before, um, thinking about this idea of disability as an important topic to cover that maybe doesn't get researched as much as others, um, and how we can improve our communities. That's kind of our why. So how can we study this so that we can make getting health information and thinking about health information easier for people so they can make good decisions for um, the people that they love. They may have a disability. So we're going to talk to you a little bit about that today. Unlike last week, um, which was our first time through, I wanted to build in some interactivity. So we have a activity at the end. So if you want to start thinking about somebody you might want to designate um, to type some things into the chat for our activity, make sure you have that ready to go because you're going to help me with a scavenger hunt-ish um, inclusion activity at the end of our presentation. Zach, did you have anything you wanted to, to say or introduce yourself before we get started? Yeah, again, I'm Zach Hart. Uh, Whitney and I are colleagues and uh, friends, uh, and we both work in the Department of Communication. Um, yeah, and I'm going to, you know, I'll talk in a little bit about just some of the work that I did, um, but I'm very excited to be here and, and talk with you all. Yes, yeah, so today we're going to go over um, just some disability facts and stats, why this is a hot topic. Uh, Zach's new research that he's been presenting a lot this year. Um, we have a theory-based Zoom activity, and then I want us to have a little time for your reflections and questions, um, because really my goal when I give this presentation and others like it is I want you to feel empowered at the end that, that we've given you a little bit of a skill that you can become um, includers in your own lives, because there's the whole point of this our why is to help other people carry on this work and so that begins with all of you um, can be doing some some health communication in your own lives that can improve others lives so um, some things to know about the dis about disabilities is one in four adults has a disability and one in six kids has a disability and sometimes when I tell people that they're surprised um, they're like well it doesn't seem like that many or I don't know that many people. Um, and maybe that's because you're not thinking of all the ways that disability might impact someone's life. It's not always a physical disability. In fact, for kids, disability can be any of these things. Um, so, and notice at the bottom of this list is invisible disability, some of the things that you can't see. So disability impacts people's lives in a lot of ways. Um, and as we're going to learn about today, our environments and um, things that are accessible for people with disabilities aren't always there so that they can live a full um, and equal life. Um, but we can make a difference. A lot of the things that we're asking people to do are not necessarily that hard to do. Uh, one of the things I found in my research was, can we just update the website so the right information is there? Can we just do that? That's not a hard thing to do, but it's important to, to think about um, the things that we can't see sometimes. So what we know is that persons with disabilities often suffer or have health, their health disparities in their health care. And what a health disparity, disparity means, if you think about that word disparity, it means a separation or it means there's a difference and there's a difference in person with disabilities outcomes in life. Everything from employment to being the victims of crimes to some very specific health things like their heart health, their likelihood to be obese, their smoking rates, their physical activity, um, and even some specific tests like getting testing when they're older um, as women with their mammograms or not receiving medical care because some of their um, 
conditions or some of the treatments cost too much. And in fact, the research I did was a lot about different ways to pay for the different types of services you might need. Um, and so if you look at the little bar chart, I don't expect anybody to remember all of these numbers, but what I want you to see in the picture is that there's a difference. And if we can improve communication and if we can improve access, maybe we can improve some of these numbers so that persons with disabilities aren't being left behind. We're thinking about them when we're trying to improve our community's health. We're thinking about the specific resources they need so we can close that gap. And that's what studying health disparities are all about. Um, and for a long time, um, people would say, oh, well, you know, that person, it's their disability which may make them overweight. Well, we found out that's not really true. Maybe we're just not giving them the resources they need to access a gym and to live healthy lives and to do things like that. So um, that's kind of, what drives this hot topic today is we're really motivated to close these gaps. So as communication research researchers, if you remember from last week, I told you um, kind of what we do. We ask questions about how persons living with disability learn about their illness. How do they find out about their illness? If you got a diagnosis today um, of, you know, maybe you took an eye test at, at school and you found out that you have some visual impairment. How do you start to learn about eye health? Where do you go for information? How do you think about that information? Who do you trust with that information? Um, we want to know how people learn how to manage what works and what doesn't work in managing the illness or the disability in everyday life. We want to know where, how, and when people find the disability information they need. And as I said with the website issue, it's not always very easy to find the information you need. And that's part of our job is to figure out why is this hard? What's missing? Um, where does it need to be so that it's easily accessible? Um, who persons with disabilities and their families trust and go to for support? So sometimes different disabilities may have a stigma attached or may be uncomfortable to talk about. And so it can be hard sometimes to find the right people to support you, um, to even give you a break if you need a break sometime, to help you do the work of um, accessing the life that you want for yourself or for your child, as Zach will talk about um, in a little bit, and many, many more. And so I thought it'd be really great as I talk about leading into these questions to introduce you to Zach, who is Isaac's dad who has had to find out a lot of these questions on his own and now has made this part of his life's work is to really improve where, how people can access, share, and manage information related to disability based on his own experience and hopefully at a much bigger level. So, so Zach, tell us about Isaac. Okay, and you can go ahead and skip to the next, uh, the next slide. So, so there's Isaac there. He is, he's here this, this morning in the other room vacuuming, which is one of his favorite activities. He will do it for an hour or longer perhaps, but hopefully at some point, maybe he'll come in and you can, you, you can kind of see him and meet him, um, you know, here, here uh, during the session. So, um, but what I thought I would do um, is just tell you a little bit about his story. Um, which is similar to the story of lots of other people uh, with disabilities. And um, also that his story is a part of my family's story and there's a community and a network of people um, that I have become a part of as a result of Isaac being, in, being my son. Um, and that I probably would have never encountered um, if, if he hadn't you know, come into my life. Um, so I'll give you just a little background. So Isaac, uh, I have two sons. My older son, uh, Christopher, is 28 years old and he's married and he's an eighth grade, eighth grade science teacher in Virginia. So I don't know how many of you are middle schoolers or not, but you know, uh, definitely. The, and Isaac is a middle schooler too, so I know a lot about, about that age. Um, and um, Isaac was born 13 years later, so um, I got a PhD in the middle of that, so I always talk about that being my middle child, um, mm -hmm. basically. Um, so there was a big, long gap in between uh, the two of them. And um, so when Isaac was born, um, he, he was born a month early. Uh, the, the labor was really fast. It was like an hour and a half. Um, kind of scary. He was feet first, so the first thing I saw on him was his right foot. 
<laughs> as he came out of his mom. And that's kind of how it's, the whole journey sort of started. We did, and Isaac um, has Down syndrome. We did not know that until after he was born. And that's not unusual for a lot of parents. We knew we were a little bit older when he was born. And there was some, um, a little bit of a push about doing some testing. Um, and we chose not to do that. Um, we knew it would not impact our decision about, you know, what to do about the pregnancy. That's a consideration for a lot of people. You know, was that the right decision there? It, you know, it's hard to say. It's everybody's kind of uh, individual choice about whether to do that testing or not. Um, there are parts of it that if you know about it ahead of time, um, you know, you, you might be a little bit better prepared. Um, but one of the things we know, know is when people do prenatal testing, genetic testing, and, and a disorder comes back as a positive result, um, there is a fairly high termination rate and we, of the pregnancy. And we knew that wasn't an option for us. So that was part of our decision making about why you know, we chose not to do testing. Um, but we began a journey then, um, which was very, you know, obviously lots of information. And I'll talk about that more when I uh, discuss the study in a little bit. But some things to know about Isaac, um, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, Down syndrome is a, is a disability that typically is, is fairly visible. You know, you can usually kind of say, oh, yeah, I think, and not always, um, but sometimes, you know, there are some physical characteristics or definitely can be some medical concerns, but everybody's different. And the way that I describe it is like, there's about 150 different things that could happen. And just like any person with our genetic makeup, you put your hand in the bag and this is the five things that you have. Um, and it, that's just like anybody else. That's how genetics works. Um, and so Isaac uh, is an enthusiastic person. He is determined. He, he is passionate. He's kind of stubborn. Um, so, and he's a teenager, so he definitely does some things like that. So we have conflict as a dad and a teenage son normally would. That's pretty typical. Um, he likes James Bond movies, but also likes Christmas and Santa Claus, and he has 40 animatronic Santas as part of a collection that he's gathered over the years. He's a big fan of Toy Story, so he's got eight or nine Woody dolls. Um, he likes to take walks. Um, he loves music, and he really loves school, too, um, in which we're doing virtually like all of you are uh, right now. And so um, he has lots of different interests that, you know, are just like what a kid who is, he's 15, he just turned 15 last week, would, would be interested in. Um, and then he has, you know, other interests that um, are very unique to him. Um, he is honest and straightforward. He, you know where you stand with him. Um, but he is probably one of the most empathetic people I know. And he can, like, even if I'm feeling like I'm kind of in a bad mood or something, he can sense it right away. And of course, will immediately kind of give you a hug and make you feel a lot better. But he can be really grumpy too, just like any, anybody. So, you know, that's kind of, how, and that's very typical for any child with a disability and kind of what that relationship with their parent um, is like. And I think that's the biggest kind of message you, we always talk about is our kids are just as much like a typical kid as anybody else. But we have some other things we have to learn about. Um, and that's, that's where kind of my research uh, ha, ha, has focused, is looking at, as a parent, uh, what, is, what kind of information do you have to navigate? So Whitney, if you want to go ahead to the next slide, before I get, kind of get into that piece of it, um, I just wanted to see if anybody wanted to say anything about what your experience with disability has been, uh, whether you know anybody with Down syndrome or have a family member with Down syndrome or really any other disability. And so I just wanted to take a couple minutes and see if anybody wanted to share just a little bit about their, their experience with disability. And if not, that's okay, but I thought I wanted to open it up, so. If you want, you can unmute, unmute your mic to speak or you can throw it in the chat. All right, um, and if you want to say things during the chat later, that's totally fine. Um, so go ahead, switch to the next one, Whitney. All right, so um, this recent study that I did was uh, talking to parents of kids uh, who have a disability, and you know why? Why did why did I do this? So when you have a kid, uh, and this is for any parent, there's a lot of things you have to learn. Um, about how to raise your child. Every parent faces that. There's a lot of information that you get. Sometimes when you're 
uh, when you're expecting a baby, there's books out there that you, I think there's a when you're expecting, like here are things, you know, we want to reduce that uncertainty and kind of know what we're going to do. Um, we've had experience uh, if, you know, most, we have, most people have parents, you know, or we've seen other people have been parents and we learn things from that. You might have babysat as you were a, as a younger person. Um, and so we know some things about what it, you know, what it is to raise a kid. You hear things from your parents or grandparents. You might have siblings who've had kids friends and so on um, that we kind of observe and we use that information uh, to try to raise our child and make decisions about that. When your child has a disability, um, you have all of that, just like you would with any other kid, but there's a whole nother level of information that, that you are really inundated with. And so one of the things that I remember the day after Isaac was born, when we were in the hospital, there was like a line of people that came and talked to his mom and me um, about all kinds of things, about what Down syndrome was. Um, Isaac also has a heart condition that he's had three heart surgeries for. So I had to learn, I've learned all kinds of stuff about a heart. I didn't know what any of that meant when he was first born. That was very scary and, you know, terrifying. Um, but they, it was just like an information dump that whole day. And you're already kind of stunned and kind of shocked, you know, that you've got this diagnosis about your child. You're not in a place uh, where you can easily absorb that information. And that's one of the key things of why I wanted to talk to parents about how do we make things a little bit easier for parents to make sense of all of this information that is being communicated to them um, so that they can make good decisions, that they can care for their child, mm -hmm. and that they can handle uh, you know, the emotional aspects. Because this information is, you know, we like to think information is like this objective sort of thing that there's no emotions attached to it. And that's totally not true. You know, when you hear a doctor come and say, your child, we think your child may have Down syndrome. And by the way, they also, it looks like they have a heart condition. You don't hear anything after that. You're just thinking, oh my God, can I do this? Um, are they gonna, I mean, I remember my first thoughts, he's got a heart condition. That was actually more important than him having Down syndrome. You know, is he gonna live? I mean, that, that's, those are your initial thoughts. So you, you don't really hear any of the explanations. And this is one of the challenges in health communication is because there are a lot of emotions attached to that information is how do you get it across in a way that people can steadily absorb it, that they can make sense of it, that they understand it. Um, because as a parent, you're gonna be asked to make all kinds of decisions, not only when they're a little baby, but throughout you know, uh, all their years as they're growing up. And then sometimes when they're adults too, um, depending on their ability and uh, level of independence, um, you'll continue to do that. So that was really the why I wanted to do a study of this is how to make that experience a little bit easier. Because you know, my personal experience, it was pretty rough. It was tough and I'm not unusual. Lots of parents go uh, through that same kind of experience. Even the way the diagnosis was delivered to us uh, was quite challenging. Um, I'm, I wasn't there, I had left uh, to go home. Um, so his mom was, did not have me there when they told her that. And the doctor basically said, didn't you know? And so it was very accusatory. Um, and so it was a very negative experience. And that is not unusual. And there's been a fair amount of research that has looked about how do you deliver a diagnosis? Um, and it really should be, you know, congratulations, you have a beautiful baby. You know, we might have some concerns here. There's, there's different approaches that you can be able to do that. And that's really been kind of the goal of my research. Whitney, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So I interviewed, uh, so here's kind of why I want to help. When you have a child with a disability, um, you learn lots of medical things. Um, when they start going to school, there's all kinds of things in the education system in terms of individual education plans, um, potentially alternative diplomas, things that prepare for their transition to an adulthood, which that's where I'm kind of at now because Isaac's 15. So a lot of what we're looking to is what happens after high school for him. Um, and then just the social interactions become really important to us because our children, you know, human beings always have some uncertainty when there's differences. And, um, and sometimes we're afraid of differences. And so it becomes important of, you know, that we have some extra hurdles. Like we want people to know our child as a person, as a human being, who's just like, has same kinds of interests as you. And so developing social networks becomes really, really important as well. Um, but some of this information is hard to understand, it's hard to process, and then often can be emotionally overwhelming. So what I did was I had a series of focus groups with parents of children with a variety of disabilities. And I won't go into how that study was done, um, but it was, again, just kind of an interview sort of format. And from the results of it, I identified a number of th themes within three areas 
um, sources that, that people get information from, um, strategies they use to get information, and then kind of the emotions that they feel. And then ultimately, what I'm looking at is how do we make sense of that information in a way that can be, um, be effective. So go ahead to the next slide, Whitney. So first thing was looking at sources and what, what I heard from many of the parents is their number one source is other parents uh, of kids that have the same uh, sorts of disabilities. Um, and that that is better than doing, you know, going online, which we do that too, um, but that you can trust uh, people better um, and that they've had experiences that are somewhat similar and they can give you advice about where to go for certain things. So for example, here in Northern Kentucky, there's a group called uh, Kids, Kentuckians Interested in Down Syndrome, and that's a parent group. Um, and we definitely, we have a Facebook page that, you know, we will throw out a question like, hey, this is going on with my kid. Does anyone know where we can go? Or can we get recommendations about doctors to go through? Or um, I'm also in a couple of other groups related to heart things. And people will post pictures like after heart surgery, like, does this look normal? You know, if there's some kind of like something's kind of swollen or something like that. And so other parents become really, really important, not only for information, but also emotional support. Um, so that was one thing, number one. Number two is a lot of the families had experts already who were like, they might already have a doctor, like a brother or a cousin or somebody who's a doctor already or who's a teacher. And so a lot of times they would go to those family experts uh, for information as well. And those, were, those two sources were probably more important than the actual professionals. We still rely on them, the doctors and the teachers and so on. Obviously that's really important. And then the final kind of source that came out was the different support organizations. So Cincinnati is really fortunate to have the Down Syndrome Association of Greater Cincinnati. It's one of the best uh, Down Syndrome organizations in the entire country. Tomorrow's the Buddy Walk, which will be virtual uh, this year. But we have, I think, the largest Buddy Walk in the entire country. About 10,000 people typically participate each year, and they raise over a half a million dollars. So it, we, very fortunate to be here. Um, to have that kind of uh, support organization. Not every disability has that. In fact, um, I'm familiar with uh, the support organization for autism, which more, more people have autism than Down syndrome, but it's not nearly as organized as the Down syndrome association. And part of that is the parents. The parents started it, the Down syndrome association started back in the early 1980s. A lot of strong advocates who really pushed that and helped to develop that as an organization. And so that, that also is really, really critical. We can go to the next slide and I'll talk a little bit about strategies. So how do, how do parents go about figuring out um, and making sense of information with strategies they use to get information? Uh, part of it is observation. Again, what other parents are going through, um, reading things that you see um, that are getting posted. Um, that's a little less active, but you're reading through those support groups and then that, that's a way that you kind of absorb. Certainly asking direct questions Internet searches are still a big piece of it, um, but even that behavior, and that's something I want to study more changes over time because sometimes we avoid information because it's hard and we don't want to know it. And so that's not always the best to go that route necessarily. And then one thing that really came across is uh, parents become very strong advocates for their children. And then through your efforts of advocating for them, you end up learning things even if you're not an expert and you don't always know what to advocate for. And so sometimes one example that I'll give about that is definitely in interactions with Isaac's doctors. You know, we usually say, oh, the doctor says do this and you just do it. We, his mom and I have gotten much better at questioning some of the things. Um, and so for example, he just got diagnosed with Crohn's disease and they immediately wanted to move to um, these injections and his Crohn's isn't quite as bad as they thought initially. And so we said, well, are there other options? And so he's actually in another medication right now that doesn't involve injections, it's pills, which is easier to give to him. Um, I'm not sure that would have happened if we hadn't asked and really kind of said, we think the shots are gonna be a little too hard to do for him. And again, that's something that you figure out at the time. You're advocating, you don't even really know you're advocating, but you end up learning things as a result of that. And that was something I heard from a lot of parents um, in terms of their strategies of seeking out information. And then the last area um, dealt, is it clicking? Then what are some of the emotions that are attached? Because this is something that I found really important. Again, information is just not this abstract thing. There are real feelings and emotions that are tied to it. Um, and so one, several things that I heard from parents, 
especially like when they got the initial diagnosis, they found themselves kind of just in a haze or a fog and they really weren't in a place where they could listen. And so that's important for doctors to understand when they're giving people information, they got to give them time to have that emotional processing before they start saying, you need to do this, you need to do that, because it's going to affect how treatment is, is complied with um, if, they're not, if they're not hearing you because they're so overwhelmed or they're just in a fog about the information, they aren't going to know what, what to do. Um, and often, yeah, this kind of this overwhelming, some frustration sometimes, especially as we became more of an advocate, you know, and we're running into barriers. But then on the kind of positive side, a lot more focus on staying in the moment and really enjoying life one day at a time and not thinking very far ahead. And I think especially during the pandemic, that's become important for everyone because we don't know what the future is going to be. Have a lot more joy over small things that your child is doing uh, every day. Um, so it's like, there wasn't a meltdown today. That is excellent, you know, and you, and you feel like that's, you take a lot more joy and becoming very, very protective. Um, and those were themes that I heard a lot in terms of the emotions associate, associated with information. So those were some of the things that I found. And then in the last slide about the, the study, then what are strategies that we kind of use to make sense of information? What you kind of find is really, when we're faced with things that we're uncertain about, we're uncomfortable with that. And that's a basic thing you learn in communication theory is, you know, how do we reduce uncertainty? And that goes across all sorts of things. Um, but one of the strategies we often use is like, I got to find something that I've gone through before that's kind of like this, because that's going to not only inform me about how to handle it now, but also can give you some comfort about this. Like, I got through that before. That was kind of tough. There's some similarities with this. Okay, I can do it again. That's, that seems extremely important. The second piece, then, and this is part of why we want those parent networks, we want to be able to connect to other people who have gone through the same thing. Again, that gives us information, but it also gives us that emotional support to get through those experiences and to make sense of what we're doing so we can make decisions. Um, those help to reduce uncertainty, but then there's a certain piece that you learn to kind of accept and cope with that, that there's going to be all this uncertainty, that some of it's never going to quite go, go away, and we can never really predict the future, and none of us can. Um, but you become a little bit more accepting and coping with that more effectively um, as a result of kind of doing these sense-making strategies. So these are things that I want to be able to help parents be able to do a little bit better um, and, and help us to do, uh, you know, to not only be a more emotionally healthy, but also to be a more effective in terms of helping to raise our children so that they can have successful and fulfilling lives. And that's really what, what the study was about. So I think that, yeah, that was it. That was the study. That's my piece of it. Um, certainly, if there's any questions, um, I'm happy to answer those, or if there's anything else. And this was at the Buddy Walk, uh, I think, three years ago now. So there, uh, that's Isaac's mom and me, and then his brother, Christopher, and his sister-in-law, Alex, are there. All right. Okay. So if, as we said before, uh, or I said at the beginning, in this next part, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need you to help me out with it. So it's designed for a little bit of interaction. So I don't know if all of you are logged into your personal tablets or laptops or computers, or if you just want to designate a person um, to shout your answers to and they can type things in. But get ready, I'm going to introduce this. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so what Zach talked about was you know, we have to study what, what the experience is. And what I can also tell you, because we've both done studies in lots of different things. Um, so I, I study organ donation and I do things with substance abuse. Every diagnosis and every journey is a little bit different. And so it takes researchers to go in there and ask all of these questions to kind of figure out what the process is for people because all of them look different and therefore you need different types of resources. You need different people to rely on. You need all different things. And that, would, that is what really makes the work really important. But a common thread that I, I think we can't overstate enough is that when we're afraid or uncertain or we're facing something new, the first place we usually look are those people that are right around us, our families, our friends, our people in our school. We want those people to love us. We want those people to help get us through. That's where we look first. Um, and that's what this, our activity is gonna be about. You, it's not the researchers and it's really not even the doctors that are the front lines of disability inclusion. It is all of you. 
you, you guys are the front lines. And so if we can make you into includers, we can spread good information about disability and disability health and improve people's lives. So um, in my research, which I'm not going to go through the whole thing, because many of the findings are very similar to what, what Zach talked about, but there's a theory that I like to use. So I'm going to introduce you a little bit to a theory called communication infrastructure theory. It's a big fancy name um, for kind of a roadmap. And what it believes is um, that humans tell stories. That's what we do. It's who we are. And that we actually learn a lot from the stories we tell. Um, I'm probably, I'm sure all of you have probably heard the story of the day you were born. So Zach gave that beautiful uh, memory of when Isaac was born and his right foot being the first thing that he saw. I bet there is a story about something that happened on the day that you were born too. And when our parents tell us those stories or our grandparents or we, find, we learn those stories, it starts to shape who we are. Um, and so maybe there's another funny story of something that you did as a kid that makes you smile and kind of reinforces the personality you think you have. That's what we're talking about. But when we study this, when it comes to inclusion um, in all different ways, you know, disability inclusion, social inclusion of different genders and races, one of the things that communication infrastructure theory asks us to consider is, what is the world, what are the stories the world are telling persons like this? Is it a good story? Is it a bad story? Who is telling the story? What's missing? Um, and so let me show you a little bit about what that looks like to bring this visual. So in this theory, and this is, this is a simple enough concept that all of us can think about it, where do we get stories from in our everyday life? We get stories from our families and our neighbors and the people we go to school with, we, we hear stories about life from those people. We also hear stories on the news. Um, and local media isn't just the news. It could be um, information you get at your library, community events, those types of things that publish information um, in your neighborhood. So if you're driving down the street um, and you, somebody has a sign up in their yard that says, you know, science is real or whatever, that's, that's local media, that's promoting something and that's a message in your community that's telling you something. And so we have to put our theory goggles on and look at all those messages and what they say and what they mean to people. And then community organizations. Zach talked a lot about the organizations that he is now a part of because of Isaac's diagnosis. All of you are part of organizations too. It might be a sports team, it might be a church, it might be your homeschool group, it might be your school. You're part of an organization and the things that they tell you about, you know, our, we are good Christians or we are brave or we are respectful, what they tell you you're supposed to be, that's a story that is shaping the way you behave in the world. Um, and there are lots of uh, other ways that those stories can either be facilitated or be blocked for different people. So stories about your goods and services. Um, what, does, what does your community look like? Do your neighbors take care of their yards or do they not take care of their yards? What does that mean? That's a message. Um, your schools, your libraries, is there transportation available? Do you have parks? Um, are there different types of people that live in your neighborhood? Yes or no, why not if they're not there? So all of those kind of conditions of our world, that's the infrastructure part, are shaping our ideas about how we think about things. And in this context, disability health. Um, so what we're gonna do in our scavenger hunt, so get ready to kind of shout out answers, is we're gonna talk about barriers and facilitators. So I want you to think about your house, your school, places in your community that perhaps exclude persons with disabilities. So can you think of, and I'll give you like a, a, a minute to shout out some answers and then we'll talk about them. Um, is there place or space in your home, community or school that a person that has a mental health issue might struggle with? What is it? Is there a person or a place in your home, community or school that a person who uses a wheelchair might struggle to access. 
a blind person might struggle with. And then in the next section, a place you can go that others have a harder time enjoying. So a deaf person might struggle going here, or a person with a communication difference might struggle at this place. Look through this list. I'll give you a couple minutes, and I want to see what you come up with. So this is, our, this is our barriers, the places that make it harder for us to include persons with disabilities in our homes, schools, and communities. So take a few minutes, and I'll put a timer on. I'm going to give you... Let's give you 90 seconds to come up with an answer for each of those and someone write it into the chat. Ready and go. Good. So a person with mental, a mental health issue or challenge might struggle with complicated math. Yes, don't we all? But particularly if um, in, a, in, a, in a virtual learning environment, that might be even harder to think about getting through that complicated math and might be requiring different ways of learning the math or a focus on, you know, um, math that is most useful for them. So that's definitely a good example. We've got online classes, screen time, good. Yeah, another um, thing I say about the math too is that if you start feeling overwhelmed and you have a mental health issue that can really kind of build upon itself. Yeah, invoke anxiety and all kinds of things mm -hmm. if you're already prone to mm -hmm. that. Absolutely, that's an excellent example. So then we've got a person with a wheelchair might struggle with stairs, yes. Um, I actually have my college students do an activity with this when they're here on campus, which many of them aren't right now. But we imagine a snow day on campus and how difficult it would be if you were in a wheelchair to try to get, because they only kind of pave a path to certain doors, well, the main doors are pretty close to stairs, it becomes, you know, a 25 minute process for that person to find a path just into the building. How frustrating that would be. Um, looks like somebody else has crosswalks, don't have the signal to say when it's safe. Yes, um, that is a huge thing to, to have the lights or the sound to help people know when it is safe. A blind person might struggle with different chores around the house, absolutely, or things in the or things in their school. What else do we have for communication? Um, music, or or maybe that's for the deaf person. Might be music. Yeah, that's for deaf. Relationships. Okay, that's really good. that's a really good one. And I think Zach hit the nail on the head when he said sometimes. Um, we feel like there's a barrier to inclusion in communication because we feel like, you know, this person is so different than us, but really, are they that different than us? So Zach gave these wonderful examples of places where you could connect. Isaac loves to take walks. Can't we do that? So it might be, um, it might be a little harder to figure out where that common ground is, but it's there. I promise you it's there. And then once you find it, really magical, magical communication can happen because you can connect with someone in a way that maybe um, you didn't think was possible. So good, but relationships are certainly a struggle, but a lot of times it's because people don't find the common ground. They are just people and they want to experience joy and the world just like the rest of us. Um, good, making friends, sports, those physical difference might struggle with. So we have to find creative ways to include. Good, very good. So what you just did is something that we would do as health researchers and we would just dig into these and ask, why is this an issue? What's missing? What is the specific barrier? So good job finding the barriers. Now let's find the facilitators. So facil facilitators are things that make it easier for us to include. So. What are the things in our homes, our schools, and our communities, and messages that allow us to include people? So something in your home, community, or school that a person with a mental health issue might achieve with. What can make their learning better? A person who uses the wheelchair might appreciate if someone did for them, or that was available. So think about the sidewalk, how there is the um, part of the sidewalk that smooths out to the road so that the wheelchair can move across the street easily. What might someone in a wheelchair appreciate that we did? A blind person, your deaf friend and you were able to do this. So that's kind of a hypothetical if you don't have a deaf friend, but what would make it easier for you to go and do something 
with your deaf friend? Or I played with my friend who has some communication differences by, what did you do? Um, or made it easier for my friend with physical differences to go with you somewhere. So let's do the same thing. I'll put on my 90 second timer and I want all of you to come up with an answer for each of these. So this is how we can facilitate better communication and ultimately better access for persons with disabilities. Ready and go. And time. Okay, so let's start looking at some of our answers for how we can be includers. So a person with mental health issues might achieve with art. That's a great example. Um, one of the things that we talk about even here at NKU is how we can think about different ways to give our assignments so that students can express what they've learned in different ways. Um, and so that's something that I try to do in my own classes, not making everything an essay or something they have to write, but allowing students to show me what you've learned. Sometimes it is through art um, that students really find a lot of success achieving learning outcomes with. So I think that's a really insightful answer from Epic. And did Epic give us his real name? I forget. He's, that was his brother, wasn't that his brother's account? That's okay. Um, making things like Braille more accessible. I think that's a really good example of many of our books and our um, resources that we have aren't accessible to persons who are blind. So we've done all of this great work about how, all the things that a person who might be blind should be able to do, but if we don't make it available in Braille, how are they gonna read it, right? Or if it's not accessible through a reader on the screen. So that is a really great answer, whomever put that in there. Um, persons with wheelchairs might appreciate an elevator, someone holding the door open, um, a ramp, just taking the extra time uh, to think about if you're having an event or you are inviting someone to your house for a party, just taking that extra moment to think about can people get into to the house or to the or to the event easily and not have to take some path that makes it harder for them. It's really nice to just get out of your car and know that there's an easy way for you to be with everyone else, that it's not um, looped around. So that's a, that's a message we can change in our environment. So um, my deaf friend and I were able to play a game. Yes, go on a walk. Um, you played friends with someone that had communication difference, differences by um, doing a board game or playing cards or absolutely. And what are some of the places that, anybody have an example of um, a place they could go that made it easier for your friend with physical differences to go with you? Um, and when I think about that, I think about um, parks that are more easily accessible. I think about games and theaters that have made an effort to make seating available so that that person that might have a wheelchair or might have a physical impairment can sit right next to me while we enjoy that event together. Very good. Um, for any of the teachers that are out there, as I was putting this together, um, there are some really great lesson plan and resources out there to include um, disability and awareness in your lesson plans. Uh, even some things that I'm gonna be sneaking into my own teaching. This here is a link to a packet that you can kind of work through that has students think through all different scenarios about some of the things we've talked about today how to take the time, take the pause to work with someone that may have a communication difference, et cetera. So this is a really nice resource and there are several others out there, but this was one I thought was easily downloadable. You don't have to do a lot of extra work as the instructor. It's kind of all laid out for you. Um, so highly recommend. So we'll end this today. It looks like we've got about 12 minutes left. I'd really love to hear from a few of you something that you've learned today or if you have any questions for Zachary. Um, we love talking about this, so so type them in the chat and we'll we'll do them as they come. When I just want to reemphasize a little bit what Whitney had said about a lot of it is just taking a little bit of time. So you know, I put the thing in there about you know one of the things with Down syndrome is their speech articulation sometimes can be a little hard to understand, and because we always are in a rush, it's like if you just take a few minutes and really listen, and that's the thing I've learned is my listening skills have hopefully improved, um, you'll, you'll, if you take that time, you'll hear what they say.
Because what sometimes happens with people with disability, because people get impatient with them with something like speech articulation, and they just won't talk because people won't take a minute or two just to let, listen to them. And that, that's a simple thing that you can do to include somebody. Jack, you got a question in there? Hardest part, the medical stuff. That's the part I don't like. Uh, it's scary, you know, I worry about them a lot because of that. Um, the other stuff is fine, you know, it's great, but it is, you know, when he has a heart surgery, that's not something I really want to do, you know, and, um, but that's definitely the hardest part is the medical pieces. But he's very strong and brave. He's gotten through lots of stuff, so that helps. <laughs> Anybody else have a story of maybe someone that they know or a family member that they know? Um, that has a disability or a community member and the positive impact that getting to know that person has made in your life? I had a question. Um, have you looked at comparing or if there's any information or studies that have already been done on um, how do people as adults um, compare to um, the the um, parents who are learning about their children's disability. So if you're an adult and you learn that you have a disability or a medical condition, um, is there any difference between how they seek out resources or their emotions associated with it? There is research about, I think, out there. I'm not as familiar uh, with that. Um, I, I would imagine, you know, the, the some of the information seeking is probably similar, um, but probably there's a little bit more reliance on other adults who have the same medical condition. So I've seen that like I'm in a, because um, of Isaac's heart condition, there's also kind of an adult group that's sort of similar. And I'm seeing that a lot with people that are, you know, they both have it as adults. And so they're kind of relying on each other that has again, that same sort of condition as opposed to kind of coming from a parental perspective. And there was one, one man in particular, I know he lives somewhere like in Thailand and he's single and has no family or anybody. So he's expressing a lot of his worry about, cause it's a heart valve issue, you know? Um, so he looks at this group as a place to give him some of that emotional support, you know, as an adult, cause I think he's like in his fifties or something like that. But yeah, there is some research that does look at it, uh, look, um, look at it in terms of how adults handle that um, and, and how you, you know, with getting the diagnosis about yourself, you know, because um, obviously Isaac, when he found he had Down syndrome, I mean, he was a baby, you know, he didn't, I don't even still that he totally understands what Down syndrome is, but a lot of people with Down syndrome that have Down syndrome, they know what it is and they understand it fully. Yeah. And then I would, I would add it, it does depend on the diagnosis and there's, I won't get into it too, to it too much, but there is a concept called biographical disruption that is different for adults. And that if, if I've lived my whole life a certain way, especially when you become disabled, maybe it's for whatever reason, you become blind or you um, are in a car accident, something alters and you are now in this, you now facing disability. There is this phenomenon of a biographical, like, and this is where the storytelling comes in, where you have to rewrite the story of your life. like this isn't who I thought I was. I was always able to do these things and now yeah. I can't. And there's a process that people go through. Yeah. Um, and that's a really, I love that work in biographical disruption. I think it's, it's so relatable to a lot of different things that people usually enjoy reading about it. Looks like we have a couple other questions, Zach. Uh, um, oh I yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, two people with Down syndrome understand, yes. Um, one th verbal skills with people with Down syndrome really ranges greatly. Um, one thing you probably wouldn't know, because what you see portrayed in the media, uh, the folks that have Down syndrome that are like actors and people like that, they tend to have, you know, really good verbal skills. Um, but probably about half the people who have Down syndrome are nonverbal. Um, but sign becomes really important. Um, and most small children, because their speech often is delayed, they will learn sign language right away. That is strongly encouraging. So you have communication occurring that way. And so obviously, yeah, they can, they can speak with each other. People with Down syndrome sometimes uh, get married to each other. That happens a lot. Some of them live independently um, and have their own apartments, have jobs, that type of thing. So yeah, it just really, but it ranges, the range is huge uh, in terms of that. And don't, and don't underestimate, uh, a lot of people think about communication as the words, but communication yes. is 
so much bigger than that. And most of our communication in a day is not our words. Most yeah. of our communication is our nonverbal, how we're feeling. And so um, we're human. And our humanness means that we there we want to do the things that we like. And there are things that we, you know, don't want to do sometimes. And that's everybody. We're happy. We're sad. We have all the emotions. That's the same. And so the way that that comes out may be different in different ways. The words might not be the same or the sounds might be the same, but communication still is happening. So absolutely, there are ways to understand each other, but it's, are you taking the time um, to notice? I have a really fun story I'll share with you. I was doing an observation once um, in a classroom and there was this uh, little boy in there and he was nonverbal and he had every day um, he had different tasks that they would have to do at school and they did it by a picture. They showed him a picture like you got to do your blocks and then you got to do your numbers and you got to do this and then you have like a play time and they have like a stack and then as you get in more involved they get to pick the order that they want to do it and so it's so funny. So this is where you have to take the time. So the one day we walk in and the, they told the little boy he got to pick his own order that he got to do things and so he wanted to start his day with playtime, and then he stole all the other kids' playtimes and put that. So his whole day was play, <laughs> play, play, and play in a picture. He didn't want to do any blocks or math or anything else, like the rest of us, right? If we got to pick yeah. our own day, we probably wouldn't want to go to work or school. We would pick play. And, and so I would say that's, yeah, that, uh, <laughs> Isaac and a lot of kids I know with Down syndrome are masters at doing things like that. <laughs> it was hysterical. But it was a great example of because they had the pictures, this different way to communicate. Uh, we all knew exactly what he wanted to do that day, and it yeah. was not math and blocks. No. <laughs> <laughs> Zach, do you know about the last one? Any programs to help educate employers to be comfortable hiring folks with a disability? That is an awesome question. So there are some uh, kind of social service agencies. Um, I'm thinking. Redwood would be a place probably, North Key and here in Northern Kentucky uh, who work with adults with disabilities quite a bit and they probably be a good resource to go to uh, in turn, because I know they help get, do job placement for individuals with disabilities too. Um, and so a lot of times there's programs kind of attached uh, to those agencies that can help with that. But I'd say contacting North Key or Red, Redwood would be good places to start for that. Awesome. Do we have any other questions? This has been a lot of fun for us. I hope this has been good for all of you. Um, and if, if you had any questions, Zach and I are happy if you wanted to email us um, to share the resources that we have or to talk to you more about anything that we talked about today. All right. If there's no more questions, I want to thank everybody again and uh, let you guys know that we will have another uh, virtual field trip next Friday. It is a meet the speaker like our last one with Whitney or meet the expert, sorry. Um, and it will be with Jason Applegate, who is one of our faculty in the um, Allied Health. He deals with radiology and he will be speaking about his um, scan of the Umi mummy and other research that he has going on with 3D printing. So um, if you're not registered, I encourage you to go to um, the Institute for Health Innovations website at NKU and get registered for our virtual field trip. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you all again in the future. Yeah, thank you guys for all coming. Thanks everybody, I enjoyed thank it. Thank you.